Good morning, folks. My name is Edmund Barrett, and I would like to welcome you to the panel, The Resurgence of Fantasy on TV. The purpose of this panel is to ask the question, one thing is for sure, The Witcher is being pelted with coins right now. What has allowed fantasy in all its forms to be produced now in a way that shows couldn't match in the past? Is it just the locations, the visual effects, or do we have a better understanding of the material and what viewers are looking for? Are we writing better for television and streaming? And now that winter is over, where will you be tossing your coin next? This morning, our delightful panelists will be discussing this question and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Off you go, folks. Starting with whom? Juliet. <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> Having you met. Okay. Um, I'm Juliet McKenna. I am uh, a writer of epic fantasy, starting with The Thief's Gamble, um, and most recently, contemporary fantasy. My new book, which was out last week, is The Green Man's Challenge. Um, and these are stories of a ordinary working bloke whose mother is a dryad. So he can see is firmly grounded in the everyday world, but he can also see the supernatural. And the green man seems to have decided that it is Dan's job to sort out clashes between everyday humans and the supernatural. So that's what I'm writing at the moment. I'm having great fun writing them. People seem to be having great fun reading them. I'm uh, Karina. Hello, everybody. Uh, Karina Stephens, and um, I write fantasy mostly. Uh, I have a book that is right now doing the querying trenches with agents, and it is a fantasy adventure, a middle grade a ch children's fantasy adventure uh, set in a world that grows on a tree. And it's kind of based in uh, Russian mythology and some uh, um, also Irish influences. And um, I have a couple of sh uh, short stories out, uh, fantasy short stories. And there's a, um, a non-fantasy steampunk one coming out in Wild Blood Press, uh, runs like Clockwork Anthology, just in time for Christmas. Oh, and I also have the very dubious distinction of having uh, studied uh, uh, TV and filmmaking in high school and having made a total balls out of uh, trying to produce a uh, high fantasy adventure movie <laughs> for my, basically, my leaving certificate. Remco? Uh, hi, I'm Remco von Straten, and um, I'm... Uh, a uh, writer of uh, fantasy with uh, Anseline Adams. Uh, earlier this year, we uh, brought a uh, book out with uh, some heroic fantasy stories, The Red Man and Others. And we also write horror stories. And uh, in a couple of weeks with uh, Flame TV Press, um, a collection comes out where we have a story um, and the collection is called Beyond the Veil. So look out for it. It's uh, suitable for Halloween and Christmas, but, you know, suitable for all the time. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Paul Anthony Short. I write uh, fantasy and urban fantasy and a bit of horror. Um, and <laughs> that's really it. Um, I've written mostly urban fantasy or a bit of steampunk inspired swashbuckling adventure fantasy as well. Okay, folks, thank you very much. Now, at risk of dating ourselves all, what is the earliest film or TV show that you can remember in the fantasy genre? And was it an adaption? Who else is old enough to remember Noggin the Nog? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't think you were. Um, these were from... Postgate, small films, um, all of Postgate and Peter Furman, who also did Bagpuss and Ivy the Engine. And they are the, the saga of Noggin the Nog. And the, they start in the lands of the north, where the black rocks stand guard against the cold sea. In the dark night that is very long, the men of the Northland sit by their great log fires and they tell a tale. And these were absolutely marvellous. 
Um, they, so I think some of the later ones were coloured, but the original ones were black and white. It was paper animation. Um, smoke was cotton wool balls. But they were the most marvellous stories of um, dragons and villains. Uh, there is, um, you know, not our hero is Nog in the Nog. His arch enemy is Nog Bad the Bad. And they were just absolutely captivating. Um, and <laughs> I've got the books um, and I have videos and they enthralled my kids as well. Even the fact that they were so um, old fashioned in the, the animation. Um, it was the stories. There's Graculus, the green talking bird, and there are dragons, and there are ogres, and all sorts of fantastical things. And they must have been first broadcast in the late 60s, because I remember watching them as a very small child. Um, and I was hooked. Well, I'll uh, stay with uh, cartoons then. Uh, maybe people had hoped for uh, all sorts of uh, classic science fiction and fantasy series on television. Um, I've got, I think the first thing I remember is Dr. Snuggles. And um, I also remember that I was terrified of it. Uh, Dr. Snuggles is a professor who invents things um, from, uh, as I remember it, all sorts of household junk. And he has a whole assortment of uh, anthropomorphic animals and things and you know, everything talks and everything is alive. And um, either Dr. Snuggles or his creator has definitely had too much mushrooms. Uh, I don't know, I found it terrifying. Uh, when I was five, I liked my fantasy, clearly defined, not too fantastic, please. Um, I also remembered uh, seeing Battlestar Galactica at the time, you know, it has robots. I could deal with that, that was fine but not Dr. Snuggles. So that's my earliest memory. I, um, I was born in uh, Ukraine in the Soviet Union. And I, the first things that I remember are these amazing live action adaptations or uh, like there was this adaptation of Pushkin's Ruslan and Ludmila, for example, um, and uh, some other kind of like uh, Russian-based fantasy films that were on TV at the time. And, uh, you know, like um, live action, uh, all the, you know, all the special effects. I have absolutely no memory of how good or bad they actually were because I was like six at the time, but I absolutely loved them. And I remember one of those, um, like, uh, okay, so in the Soviet Union, instead of Christmas, we had this New Year's Eve celebration with um, um, kind of the Soviet version of a Christmas tree, which was basically a Christmas tree, you know. I mean, you didn't have any religious uh, overtones there. And uh, so, um, and there was uh, this one story about um, children, I think, uh, going into that Christmas tree and having adventures there. And there was a character that there that looked like, you know, a cat, but wasn't a cat and uh, like, you know, a man cat. <laughs> Um, and uh, that's pretty much all I remember, but it had profound influence on my writing because, um, well, like, like I said, the book that I'm uh, the writing right now or have written is about kids going into a world that grows on the tree. So guess where that came from? <laughs> uh, but then I immigrated to Israel when I was about six and a half and we had one channel um, I remember, and on that channel, we would have the occasional, you know, fantasy or science fiction um, series where you would see maybe one or two episodes and then it would be gone forever from your screens. So it's really hard to remember which one I remember, which one of those was first and which one of those um, had any effect. I do remember a cartoon series that was uh, probably... I, I would have seen a lot of the episodes and that's around the world in 80 days. Um, and uh, there's actually going to be an adaptation of that with David Tennant soon. So I saw, I saw a trailer, which I'm really excited for, but um, um, I don't know if, uh, if that counts as fantasy, steampunk, or just 
you know, contemporary for Jouverne because there's like, okay, so you had hot air balloons and you had basically things that actually existed, trains. <laughs> hmm. yeah. um, my big ones, there's, there's three really, I think. Now, one is cheating because it's a movie, not a TV show. Uh, the movie was The Last Unicorn. Uh, oh, yeah. which I had on tape and watched until the, the tape actually snapped <laughs> over and over. I adore The Last Unicorn. I actually had the great privilege of meeting Peter Beagle two years ago. He's a wonderful man. Um, but yeah, there was that. Um, there was uh, there was He-Man. That was a massive, massive thing for, for me as a kid. In terms, in terms of fantasy, that was probably one of my earliest introductions to the con- to a lot of the fantasy concepts of you know sword and sorcery style storytelling. <clears throat> and then, aside from that, it would probably be this might be slightly cheating. Uh, Cities of Gold. Yeah, I remember that one. Um, which was. A little more, not, not quite. I think it's not so much fantasy as much as just lost technology. But you know that can. I think. I think. I think it, it counts as, as fantasy in terms of the the trappings and styles of the show. It was very much a fantasy adventure, as much as anything else. So those those are my my main three. Okay, well that's great, folks. Let's move on to the nub of the question. What do people think has allowed fantasy in all its forms to be produced now in a way that couldn't be matched in the past? Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order. So, Paul? Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of... You go to sleep for a couple of minutes there. I know, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm... Caffeine. <laughs> so... Um... How do you really want to say that there hasn't so much resurgence, just more of um, acceptance of it as a mature um, genre? Because if you look back, there's always been some kind of fantasy on TV. Um, we had, I mean, in the late '90s, we had shows based on Tarzan and Sinbad, which were, I think, Canadian made. They were really bad like, like they were no, no, no not bad but they were they were cheese they were written very cheesily the effects were leaning heavily on what had be, only just become more cheaply available cgi um <clears throat> even though it, it was showing starting to show his age um but for a long time we've had we've had fantasy on tv for a very long time but the issue is that it's been treated as a kid's genre I think what's really more happening isn't that there's more fantasy on TV. It's just that we're accepting that fantasy can be something for adults. It can be a, it can be taken seriously as a genre. And I'd say Game of Thrones has a fair bit to to a bit, bit of credit to take for that in presenting it in a more unexpected way. I think. So I think that's really the the thing. It's not so much that I mean, yes, the effects have gotten cheaper. Adaptations have gotten a bit more. Well, this is actually kind of, I think, feeds into to what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Adaptations are taking things more seriously. They're not just trying to turn it out as okay. Let's how you know how do we make kids buy this? How do we make it make it accessible for merchandising and toys? Um, they're actually looking to tell a real story now with things. Um, I, again, this, I mean, this isn't TV again, so I'm cheating. Uh, but if you compare, say, the David Lynch adaptation of Dune to what we've seen so far of the upcoming uh, movie, th- th- they look, they're very different. They're, they're, these are going to be very, di- very different movies. Um, and I think it is a case of, you know, one being treated more maturely uh, than the other. I think um, we we can say that, okay, special effects, settings, it's uh, just kind of a um, side thing, but I think you really can't overestimate uh, the effect of special effects on the resurgence, because uh, if you think about it, you, you only have very... Uh, limited resources uh, when you uh, when you're in production both uh, physical money wise and also mental in a way and uh, if um, 
if the special effects are cheaper and easier to produce and uh, everything looks uh, less cheesy, if the settings are cheaper to produce, then you have a lot more scope to consider everything else, like the directing, like the acting, um, the story itself. And you can also go into more, uh, you know, uh, more, in, more into high fantasy, more into, uh, you know, various genres, uh, crossovers, wh whatever, whatever you like. Now, I have some bad experience with that because when I was trying to produce that uh, uh, fantasy uh, film for my living cert, uh, we had a really good uh, studio in, uh, in school. Uh, especially dedicated to our class, who was the, you know, the, uh, the film students. And, uh, but uh, I had, I had a story, I had some trouble uh, casting, but when it came to, you know, actually producing it, I was so fixated on getting the special effects right. And, uh, you know, the, the costumes and the, the setting and the studio that everything else just fell apart because I, I wasn't focusing on anything else. Uh, so we had sound problems. Hmm? You had a bit of a case of George Lucas disease? Oh, totally, yes. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, I, I ended up asking a, a more junior class to uh, pitch in because there was so much to do. And uh, um, the sound in one of the, you know, one of the days of production, there was no sound. So that was that was it, and uh, uh, the film never got edited. And when I was showing the um, uh, the teacher who was doing the grading, it was kind of going, oh, okay, no, no, not so great, not so great. Oh, I love this special effect. There's this uh, crystal ball with a gnome inside it, and, <laughs> and um, basically just gave me the grade uh, just for that. So I got 80 instead of a fail. But yeah, I mean, uh, the, this is, uh, I think this is also one of the reasons why the, the studios and the showrunners and, you know, um, producers, whoever is in charge, are allowing more fantasy to happen because, uh, um, well, it's cheaper, it's more, again, it's also, it's more accepted by audiences, uh, young and new. So they know that they can sell it. They know that it's doable, that it's not going to fall apart because of uh, all the technical reasons. So, you know, the, let's uh, kind of, let's go, let's try these things. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say like, you know, even if you have the, um, the special effects um, and the money to produce it, uh, there still has to be the will. Um, I think a big uh, factor in this is that uh, like uh, the people who grew up with uh, the major fantasy things like He-Man, for example, Shira, uh, I don't know, um, the things that, you know, we are all remembering fondly, like, oh, you know, that was good. That was my childhood. Those people are now in charge. Uh, they are now the decision makers. So they are now so like, oh, yeah, no, uh, I want to see more of that stuff now. So that's why you also get a lot of uh, remakes. Uh, Sierra, He-Man, he um, well, you have more Star Wars happening. Uh, what else is happening? Uh, I don't know. A, a lot of things are uh, being remade right now. And I think it's uh, nostalgia is a big factor in that. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, it does take a little bit of um, weaning as well, um, you know, especially people who really hold the money, they can be a bit um, tight on the budgets. Um, Paul, you mentioned uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, I think Game of Thrones definitely showed it could be done, but I think that before Game of Thrones, it was Rome uh, who showed like, okay, you can have a really big series uh, with a whole different world, uh, cost a lot of money and have big, big stories set in that. Mm. I think Rome really showed it could be done. And then before Rome, it was, um, I would say, Gladiator who showed uh, that there was an appetite for it. And so, you know, everything builds on other things. It's not just simple one thing that suddenly, boom, happens. It's stones uh, ticking on other stones and causing an avalanche. Yeah, I um, agree with what everyone said so far. 
And uh, the money thing is key because back in the day, fantasy either had to be animation if it was going to be on TV as a series because that was cheaper to do. And if it was going to be a big project, it had to be a film because that's where you know the budgets for special effects and all the rest of it were. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the films, the special effects simply could not carry a movie. Um, I mean, you know, Hawk the Slayer, Kroll, with the best will in the world, you know. But there were the movies that were fantasy. There was The Princess Bride and there was Lady Hawk and Willow. And they were absolutely you know, core epic fantasy. Well, Princess Bride is a thing of itself. But yeah. it's interesting that those films became, well, you know, the, the term cult classic may or may not be entirely uh, appropriate. But actually, for fantasy films, all of those are very low on special effects. You know, um, William Goldman insisted if we're going to have a giant, we've got to have a giant. Fortunately, they found Andre the Giant. Um, you know, Willow is, uh, I think, the movie that gave um, short people more employment opportunities since The Wizard of Oz. Um, and, you know, apart from a bit of fade in, fade out with Rutger Hauer and Michelle Pfeiffer, and, you know, there's not a lot of special effects in Lady Hawk. So the performance, the story was what came to the fore. And I think those films are important because they have persisted and they have um, shown what fantasy could do in a way that films that tried to do more with, frankly, special effects that were simply not up to the standard and some fairly ropey writing. Let's not you know, kid ourselves. Um, and I think the, the persistence of the better films has is important um, in so that once the cost of special effects came down and those of us who had grown up with fantasy fiction became adults, became decision makers, moved into film and TV production, um, you know, there were there were good examples to reference. Yeah, that's great stuff. I'm going to go a little bit off my list here just to make you all think. Now, you've kind of raised the, the question that there were some earlier attempts where ambition was big and possibly budgets or special effects weren't necessarily up to the job. Do people think that some of these earlier attempts, be it film or television, kind of potentially tarnished and put back fantasy? Um, that the weaker examples, people looked at them and said, well, this is fantasy and this isn't very good. Julia? Absolutely. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I don't really have much to add um, beyond that. Um, it's fantasy, and it was always a bit odd. I, one of the things that Karina reminded me of was the Saturday morning uh, heavily dubbed um, folkloric fantasies from places like um, Czechoslovakia before the fall of the Iron Curtain. Does anyone else remember the singing ringing tree? Mm hmm. Um, and that was pretty much the only fantasy that you saw on television. And it was very odd. <laughs> so there was this, that I think also will have had a, an impact, that fantasy was not very good for kids and really a bit strange. Very cheesy in places as well, mm. I think. Yeah, because I remember I, I've always really loved fantasy, but uh, uh, I always kind of felt that, okay, so for books, I love to read fantasy because I can imagine all the settings and <coughs> all the special effects, uh, you know, in my head. But uh, uh, for, uh, you know, when I watch speculative uh, shows on TV and sometimes in film, I prefer science fiction because somehow they, a lot of them tend to be slightly less cheesy and fantasy just, uh, I, I, just I, didn't I work. Don't. I'm not sure whether that's uh, true necessarily. Um, I think it's it's not always a lack of technical ability. You know, there uh, you can talk about the special effects. The special effects were not there. Uh, I, I think in the 1970s, 80s, there was a lot that could be done. Uh, there is a lot that can be done 
when you don't have a lot of effects that you can do with good writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is that a lot of television shows, um, you know, just were written for the big masses. And it was a case of like, well, you know, we have to crank out uh, 26 shows uh, every year and for, you know, big audience. So this will do, you know, if you look at uh, the Incredible Hulk, for example, or even um, Buck Rogers, um, Battlestar Galactica, you know, there are episodes which are really good, but there are, for each of those episodes, there are five episodes which are really, really ropey and mm -hmm. not good. So I think we are also tend to remember the things that are good. Uh, and there were just a lot of things which are bad and have they dragged the genre down? I don't know. I don't really think so. Uh, they probably just didn't make a lot of a mark. Uh, does anyone, for example, really remember things like Matthew Starr? Like, no. see, there you go. Uh, it's another childhood memory. I know it exists, the internet told me, but <laughs> you know, that's about it. And nobody, at least I hope so, nobody will go like, oh yeah, Matthew Starr, that was so great. I'm going to do a remake in 2021. <laughs> yes, but a lot, a lot of the, the shows that you mentioned are science fiction, and I think the good writing went more into science fiction for TV shows than into fantasy. Yes. It might be fair um, to say that the other slight problem to my mind, and see if you agree, it's a lot easier for cheap science fiction to look good, whereas cheap fantasy can look very quickly like LARP, live action role play. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Yeah, like even even a good uh, show like uh, I really love the Tenth Kingdom, right? Um, it's uh, it's one about uh, you know some people going into a world behind a mirror, and it's uh, there's a lot of fairy tales. There's uh, Yamana plays Al, Al Bund Bundy as a, you know as a troll, and I really loved it. But if you look at it, it's just so cheesy as well. Yeah, I mean but... science fiction had uh, all the advantages of model makers. Um, yeah, the model work on things like Space 1999 and um, Star Trek and uh, Brain is Failing Me Completely. Um, yeah, they had, uh, you, they, you could do some really very, very good things with models and miniatures that just, you can't do a dragon like that, you know, um, and TV could not afford Ray Harryhausen. But do you need a dragon? I mean, like, you know, if you have, uh, if, if you take uh, Robin of Sherwood, and yes, I think it is fantasy because it does have. Yeah, I agree. It dragon. is, yeah. But it doesn't have dragons. And you can, and if you look at it, uh, go like, oh, yeah, it's guys with mullets, uh, live action role playing in Sherwood Forest or whatever parts of wood they use. But it's great because the storytelling is great, the acting is great, the emotions are great. Um, so, you know, I, I think it just does not come down to, um, you know, the budget. It doesn't come down to the effects. Uh, it does come down to intelligent storytelling. It does come down to acting. Um, know your limits and work with them. You know, I think it's better to have a limited budget and work with it than have a limited budget and try to do the dragon anyway. Yes. Yeah. And if yeah. you think back to something like Sapphire and Steel, um, yeah, I mean, what they did with very limited scope in terms of uh, sets and resources and all the rest of it, but you've got David McCallum and Joanna Lumley absolutely towering performances at the centre of some really interesting and well-written and very creepy stories. I don't know if we'd call that fantasy, horror, whatever, but... Um, yeah, that was. Oh, uh, Sapphire I, I, Steel was very, yeah. again very heavily sci-fi sci rather than fantasy, well, and uh, Ed you made the point. You know, it's it is easier to make sci-fi look good on the screen than it's fantasy mm -hmm. because you can make sci a sci-fi can be quantum leap. There is nothing fancy about that other than the hologram door effect and Al's handheld handheld device. Basically, that's it. Other than that, it's just period pieces set in the 1960s and 70s, mostly. 
but it's still fa- it's still sci-fi because of the concept. Fantasy, by its nature, has to be a different world. Mm-hmm. So it takes more work overall to get it right. And again, this this I think comes back not not just to budget, but also to taking it seriously and mm-hmm. treating it maturely. Um, science fiction has always enjoyed a place of privilege in genre fiction compared to fantasy. It's always been of the two. It's always been the more tr- treated as more grown up uh, for adults genre, because typically, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, you had your your Frank Herbert, you had your Heinlein. All of this stuff was for decades now has been treated as for a very high minded. It's it's all allowed to be. It's allowed to be critical of culture and society and politics, and it's allowed to be interpretive and explore different things. Whereas fantasy has frequently been relegated to the kids' table. Mm. You know, once you get past Tolkien, and even still there, any fantasy novel typically is the, the immediate assumption is it's for kids. Uh, I, I seriously don't uh, think that is right. Not now. I mean, like. Um, oh no! Not. I mean, it's it's change. I agree. It's changing now, but for the la- for for the last and several decades, it's been. And and don't you think that uh, the same can be uh, said of science fiction uh, stuff like you said, like oh yes, uh, Heinlein, uh, Asimov. Ooh, um, but look. You know, the kid who is sitting with his science fiction book uh, in the bus is going to be bullied by the other kids uh, just as well for his science fiction <laughs> as for the fantasy. So, honestly, I, I honestly don't think that's the case. Um, and science fiction movies also, there is the same load of tripe made as in fantasy uh, films and uh, series. I think actually that uh, just move things forward a bit. Uh, we're now at the point uh, that you know you can spend a lot of money on a film or a series. Uh, you can make it look really good uh, with all the science fiction, uh, special effects, spaceships, dragons, everything. And still it can be uh, pretty bad because you forgot to tell a good story. Okay, well, that's, oh, absolutely, that's but that one, I think we might move on. Do you think adaptions uh, from Pacific books or stories are more successful than fantasy that's necessarily originally written with for um, for television? Can I, make, I, I just wanted to make another point before we move on. Yep. One of the things I think that has driven uh, much more interest in fantasy on television is the success of computer games. Um, because fantasy has been a massive element of the rise in computer games, which is now an industry that does more than film TV put together. Um, And I think that filmmakers and TV makers have cottoned on to the fact that there is a massive appetite for fantastic adventure. And it's games like Skyrim and Elder Scrolls and all the rest of it. I don't play these things. The Witcher. Sons do, which have... They have a depth. They have um, a fully realised world in them. And those things make kajillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has convinced film and TV makers that there is an appetite for well-written, immersive uh, uh, fantasy fiction on screen. Um, Because when they see the possibility of making some serious money, they're going to take it seriously. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, uh, um, sorry. So uh, adaptions uh, from books or written originally for television, which do you yeah. think is more successful? I think adaptation can have a bit can be a bit of a double edged sword because mm. uh, you you have some amazing adaptations like well The Witcher for example, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, you can really anticipate a book that you really love and you see, oh my God, it's coming to the cinema. The Golden Compass, which is basically Northern Lights is Dark Materials. And you go to the cinema and it's such a big disappointment despite the amazing special effects, despite the amazing casting. And um, on the... um, um, on the other hand, you can uh, have a, a book that is also really well adapted, whether or not you have seen it, uh, 
and uh, uh, so so or or a book that you didn't like and you're not going to you weren't going to go watching because well, let's say um, uh, Game of Thrones right I hated that book I did not read uh, the sequels I couldn't you know it was just so not for me even though it was fantasy it should have been mine but it wasn't and then I watched the first couple of episodes of Game of Thrones on TV eh, okay well um, and then okay I'll give it another chance so um, I watched a few more and got totally hooked until, of course, the last season, where it all went a bit um, <laughs> you know, nosedive. But, um, um, you know, like it was, uh, it was a complete reversal. And uh, the reason for me to not have watched it w- was because it was an adaptation of Game of Thrones. So you, <laughs> you have a bit of, a, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. And then on the third hand, you have things like, um, the Good Place, not an adaptation of anything as far as I know. And it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think that there is um, it, that there is a couple of uh, things. This is all true. Um, I think that the adaptations uh, of uh, games, uh, books, and comics are not uh, primarily made for the fans of the games, books, and uh, comics. Um, especially comics, like uh, the, the comics publishers would love it if uh, as much people who watch the television series would actually buy the comics, but they, <laughs> they don't really. Um, but it does come with a, a, a certain name recognition um, and, you know, the world is all there already, so uh, it's already proven to be a, uh, a valid concept so uh, the investors will say like okay yeah it's it's already uh, been vetted uh, so that makes a decision making um, easier uh, even people who have never read the books or played the games uh, will still recognize the name so that helps a little bit with uh, PR as well also from the um, you know the uh, the press um, like uh, an a fan website will easier pick up something based on uh, a Witcher game than something that comes uh, completely out of nothing. So uh, adaptations have, um, you know, they're, I can see where it comes from that they are uh, going to be more popular with the people who make these things. For the fans, indeed, not necessarily. Um, I think you'll have to learn to... um, live by the thing. Uh, I don't know, can't, can't remember who said it, like, uh, oh no, they didn't ruin the book, book's still there on the shelf. <laughs> Raymond Chandler, I, I certainly remember he um, was once asked that question, you know, do you think move, the movies have ruined your books? And he ran into his library and said, no, look, they're still here. Um, <laughs> I think um, the key is not whether it starts as a, uh, a book, a short story, a comic, a novella, because I ended up with a list of excellent examples of all of those things and a list of rubbish examples of all of those things. Um, I think the key thing is you've got to have respect for the source material. Um, and the, the showrunner has got to understand the differences between film and TV and comics and books as narrative media because what works in a book is not necessarily going to work on the screen what works on the screen is not you know is not necessarily going to be an accurate reflection of a comic um and i think one of the reasons that good omens was such a success was the fact that neil gaiman was absolutely key to it and in various interviews, he's spoken of the various approaches he and Terry Pratchett had over the years from people who wanted to make it. And they absolutely held out until they were convinced they had the right team to do it. Um, and Neil was absolutely central to that process. Compare and contrast The Watch which I haven't watched because um, I love the Discworld book so much. And what I read in the preliminaries about the casting and the changes and the, oh, we've got a much better idea. We're going to make Vetinaro woman and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do that. And you're thinking, why are you even bothering? 
Mm -hmm. um and as i say i haven't even bothered watching it and the responses of people um i know and trust have convinced me that no there is absolutely no point in me watching it because i'm absolutely going to hate it um so i don't think the source material is necessarily determinative but the way that the ideas are handled and presented is what makes or breaks fantasy on screen there was actually an I early just, idea I'm, to... I'm, I might just cut you off. We're down to the last 10 minutes, so I might ask oh, one last question. <laughs> um, yes, time. Um, essentially, I finish up with, what fantasy series which hasn't uh, been remade or hasn't been announced would you like to see make it to television? And yes, we will take it as a given that any material of your own, you're allowed, you would you would like to have one of your own made. We'll take that, like a politician voting for themselves, as perfectly acceptable. Okay, Emko, I cut you off. So we'll... yes, uh, I'm I'm raring to go. Uh, yesterday we saw um, we we saw the Green Man, and I think the time is really really ripe uh, to do Mythago Wood. So I don't want to discuss it. That really needs to be done. Um, also, since we are in uh, on the island of Ireland, that this is Octocon, uh, why haven't we done um, Cahoolan here yet? So we we've got we've got amazing actors here. Uh, we've got well, we've got the landscapes. Uh, we've got all the technical staff uh, who have worked on Game of Thrones, um, on Dungeons and Dragons. You know, we have everything here. But we're always waiting for these big productions to come here. We film everything, and then everyone uh, goes back to their day jobs. That's how it seems to me. So you know, we should really do this thing before some American does it, and um, you know, you get something like Celtics. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was gonna say actually, slight. The method. The last question is personally the only the only fantasy ser TV series I can think of in the last twenty years that hasn't been an adaptation that was in any way successful has been Avatar. So it's amazing. I think yeah. that all que the, the question is kind of which is more success more which is better or more successful. It's answered. The only fantasy that gets made really is adaptations. Mm. No one's making mm. new fantasy just for TV. So I think that's kind of my answer to this second question is I'd like to see more original fantasy made for TV. Um, like adaptations are always going to come. There's always going to be the reboot of the next thing coming in. Um, and I'd love to be able to say, yeah, I want a live action miniseries based on The Last Unicorn because that would be fantastic. Um, I know who I'd cast. You have to cast Jeff Bridges as King Haggard. You just have to. Um, but yeah, I would actually love to see more original. We got original made for TV science fiction. It's not treated as, as seriously as something that's, that's adapted, like say The Expanse, for example. But I would like to see it start because it's got to start somewhere. I think the reason that sci-fi, one, one of the reasons we haven't touched on that sci-fi gets a better break is it's just had longer to brew mm. and and grow in the in, in society on TV than than fantasy has. It's had there's more of it, so people can make the mistakes and get it right and build the respect and appreciation for it. If fantasy is going to be treated properly and maturely by audiences and creators, it needs to be allowed to grow and make the mistakes and get better over time. I think one of the key things here is where are we drawing that line? Because as far as I'm concerned, Buffy, Angel, Supernatural, Misfits, Being Human, um, Motherland, Fort Salem, they're all fantasy as far as I'm concerned. And they're all original for TV. Um, if we are looking for t book series to adapt, I, I could be here till lunchtime. There is so many good e epic secondary world fantasy um, to be brought to the screen. I'd love to see some of the things that Kate Elliott has written, um, Spirit Walker series, the Crossroads series, um, and McCaffrey's Pern. Yeah, why, why have we not seen that on screen yet? 
um, but also to expand the um, scope a bit, there is uh, some great stuff being done in Regency fantasy. Zencho's Sorcerer to the Crown is uh, an absolute delight. And I think that's the sort of fantasy that might get people who say they don't like fantasy. You know, this is um, sorcery in Regency England. Um, if you think about the success of Strange and Norrell, there is a lot of books out there that could be adapted for people to say, oh, no, I don't really watch fantasy, but I will watch that. Yeah, I think uh, Rivers of London would do a really good job because uh, it's urban fantasy. So, mm. um, you know, you need to do a little bit less world building for that and uh, um, less, a little bit less world showing. And it's a fantastic series of books. And uh, okay, again, it will uh, bring people who are into uh, crime uh, fiction as well into the into the fold, like uh, uh, like Lucifer does at the moment, for yes. example. Yeah, um, and definitely plus one on Pern. But uh, uh, just to go back to something Paul said, Avatar: The Last Airbender. I've seen that series at least ten times over. I love it. There is actually um, talk about a Netflix adaptation, a live action adaptation of that, which I both anticipate and dread. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially actually, since the original creators have pulled out. That probably brings mm -hmm. up. We've got a question yeah. from the audience, which I think tags on quite nicely to last which is what makes a successful deviation from the source material? This is pretty much our last question. Uh, Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Um... <laughs> well, um, it's science fiction again, but the Children of Men movie has very little, very few points of contact with the original book by P.D. James. The book on its own merits is a good book. The film on its own merits is a good film. They've taken the concept and written it for a movie rather than trying to create a slavish adaptation of the book. Okay, live and learn. I didn't know it was a book. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think they did a really interesting uh, choice with uh, uh, the recent series of His Dark Materials on BBC. Yeah. Because uh, they, they basically took the first book, uh, Northern Lights, and the second one, The Subtle Knife, and they sort of weaved them together because now mm. Will's story starts uh, during the first. Uh, uh, season and uh, you, you basically you uh, instead of having in the second season a whole bunch of potentially boring and less fantasy like uh, scenes with him at home they're sort of woven in to the first one so it gives a much better momentum yes um i would say um going a bit uh, back in time here i think paul verhoeven did um something great with uh, Starship Troopers uh, from Robert Heinlein. He took something which was mm, um, and he gave it gave it his really his own slant, uh, worked in some social commentary as well. And, you know, it's still something that uh, pretty much uh, stands on itself and can stand uh, the test of time as well. I actually read the book a couple of years ago, and I was actually very surprised that there was some overlap. I taken it as a given when I cracked open the cover that the 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 overlap would end at the cover in terms of the title. It was, oh, some of these characters are the same. They're kind of doing the same stuff. Although I must admit, being kind of launched out the front of the ship, kind of in what amounts to a giant uh, a giant pistol, sort of. No, you're all right. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I used to be and I still am a huge Heinlein fan and uh, um, I took uh, Starship Troopers with me to boot camp when I went to, to serve in the army. Um, it was the second time I read it. <laughs> Oops, and I think we're actually getting the time out. Um, so, folks, I would like to thank you very much. I think uh, I think we solved all of the world's problems as they pertain to TV <laughs> fantasy. Thank you very much, everyone. Um and if there are any further, yep, time's up. And yeah, any further questions, aim them towards Discord. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.